most people travel with portable fridges these days and if you're not careful you're going to end up with a flat battery. They leave the towns, drive out in the bush with the fridge full of frozen goods, stop for a day or two camping and fishing and when they hop in the vehicle the battery's flat. So it's advisable to carry one of these solar panels. You can trickle charge your battery the whole time with your fridge on. The idea is you have a very long lead so you can park your vehicle in the shade all day and put your panel out in the sun. And that way you won't have a flat battery. When you install a fridge in your vehicle, you should put it up high because what happens is we overpack our vehicles. That's just a fact of life. You always end up with a lot of gear. And you're bouncing down the road and your swags or whatever can roll down on top of these, block off the air vents, your fridge can overheat and of course at the end of the day the fridge is not working. So I've got mine right up here on a platform. And the other thing is too that it's always easy to get at and have something to eat. Mm. Very relaxing out here in the bush, open fire, beautiful day, waiting for the billy to boil. You know that I've got a shovel on the coals. I'm heating it up, and that's my bush barbecue. I've just changed the bait in this crocodile trap here and it's always a rotten, smelly job. Always end up very dirty. Back at the vehicle, I've got a great way of cleaning up. Under the bonnet, we've got a bush shower. I've got my 20 litres of water here, a long black hose and a shower hose. Now, it's just a matter of lifting the bonnet and connecting up these two hoses. We've installed what's called the Glind Aussie Bush Shower. Basically it runs through the heating system that you use inside your car there. Up here in the tropics we don't have to have the motor running because you get warm water. If you're down south where it's cold, you'd regulate the temperature of the water by idling your motor and using the, the little on-off heater switch inside the car. The hotter you want it, the further you turn up your heater switch. So what I do now is just pop this one on there quickly, just screw it on, and the black hose goes into my drum. The reason you have a very long one is to throw it out into a river or a stream. If you're out in the bush and you come to a stream, just pull up and throw your hose out into the water. This is already connected up. We've got a filter on here. Just pop that on and just start it up. One day, here. How many times do you want to go fishing and you go to your lure bag and you pull your lures out and they're all tangled up like this and it drives you up the wall because all you want to do is flick a lure. But I tell you what, the best thing is to make up a lure bag. See that? That one's made out of clear plastic, very heavy plastic so the treble hooks don't stick into it. You can see all your lures and make it up and it's got a little strap here. That is just wonderful. Here next to me, I've got a bigger one. See, one of these swag clips on it. Isn't that great? <laughs> All your lures, and out they come, and you're a happy fisherman.
One of the best things I've had for a long time. When you're out in the bush chasing mud crabs, you always end up with these lumps of smelly fish. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's really bad. I'll get rid of it. But a better way, if you're travelling long distances from home and you don't have any way of keeping your fish fresh or you haven't caught anything and you're after a feed of mud crabs, is to go to the supermarket and get some of these little tins of seafood. This one is, oh, flake tuna supreme. So we just put a little wire on the top there to hold it into the pot. Two or three holes in it, top and bottom. <coughs> oh, that was terrible, the smell. Just wire it quickly into the crab pot here. Now, the idea of this is all the oils and the little tiny pieces of meat come out through those holes and attracts the crabs. And the crabs can't pinch your bait. So it's really a great way of catching crabs. So we just drop that over the side there. And I'll come back in 10 or 15 minutes and check it. Yeah. Oh, look at this. <laughs> That's not too bad, is it? Two beautiful mud crabs. Just have a look at the size of... Oops, look out. Just have a look at the size of this big one here. Oh. When you pick a mud crab up, always pick it up by these rear swimmers here. Jeez, is that? Fair sized crab. Come on. Come on, mate. There we are. Have a look at that. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful crab? Now, if you try and put more than one or two of these in a bag, they're going to fight, they're going to break their nippers off. And of course, when you get home or back to the camp, if you haven't got any ice, they're going to be rotten. Don't want to waste them. So what you do is tie them up. I'll just show you how you do that. Very simple, very easy to do. Right, I've got him by the nippers. The best thing is to put your foot, your big toe, or I'm using reef boots on the shell there. And now you've got him pinned down. Drop the the cord under the under the main shell and on top of the front nippers. Right now, that's in place. You bring it around over over the front of that main nipper. See how it locks in on this little hook here? So it just goes around there and now you just take it around either under the swimmer or one of the rear legs. Right, now we'll just do the same with this one. Just, it's better to do it fast than slow. We'll just bring it around under there. Lock it on that front section where I'm pointing there. Right, pull them in together. See, we're just pulling them together. See how those front nippers are locked? towards the shell now. Now I'm just taking the black cord in under one of the back legs or the rear swimmer. In this case, under the leg because the swimmer is broken. Just a little knot there. Just, just tie him up. And there we have it. All bundled up. When you put those crabs together in a bag, they won't fight. It's a good idea to pack them in.
lots of wet hessian, or if you haven't got hessian, when you put them in the bag, put some mangrove leaves between them, and then they'll just settle down there and keep them nice and damp, nice and cool. Take it back to the camp, and take it home. for a crab and I've caught him on the tuna mornay and well, he's gonna have a go at me and he's mangled up that tin just get him out show him to you what a beautiful crab oh, have a look at that wow isn't that a magnificent crab have a look what he's done to the tin the power of those claws see how he's chewed that tin up Just get hold of these nippers. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, oh. Right over. So it just goes to show you don't have to have those smelly pieces of fish. You can come away with your tins of cat food. How often does this happen? Down on the beach, remote part of Australia, the tide coming in. I've got what appears to be a very serious bog. Now if I kept spinning those tyres, very soon I'd have the diff housing down in the mud and that's virtually impossible to get out of. But I've got just the thing in the back of the car to get me out of that bog very quickly. It's called the portable rescue tree. <coughs> One of these is absolutely essential out here in the bush. You actually need your four wheel drive, diff lock, your winch, and one of these. And you can get out of just about any bog. Now I've got to move pretty fast because that tide's coming in. Just a matter of pulling that pin out, taking this handle out here, folding down these wide sections and tightening them up, it takes a second or two, sliding that pulling arm out, dropping that handle on there, put the pin back in and it's ready for use. portable trees in place so now I go back to the vehicle start the vehicle up start winding the winch in and the portable tree will bite down into the sand and it should pull me out very quickly Take me a minute to pack it up, back in the car, and I'm away from the danger zone of that rising water. And another catfish. So often out in these mangrove creeks and tidal rivers, this is all you catch. 
and people treat them with a lot of disrespect and curse them and throw them back, well, they're not the best eating, but when you're out in the bush and you don't get anything else, these aren't too bad. But you've got to be very careful of the poisonous spikes. There's one on the dorsal fin here and two on those pectoral, those side fins there. And if you're going to keep these catfish and eat them, make sure you take those off. What I normally do with a fish like this is just put it down so it's dead. It's just a nervous system now twitching and grab those side fins and snap them off. See, you got rid of it. These spikes have a skin membrane over them. That's the skin there. Get rid of that. And now you can see the serrated edges there. They're very dangerous. See them there? So if you get it in your foot, you can't pull it out because those serrated edges only go one way. And you've got a very sharp point here. Very poisonous. Very dangerous. But once you get rid of them, you can take your catfish home and cook them. does make me mad. Somebody's put in a, an illegal net on the mud flats north of Broome, but they've left the net here. So what's happened? This giant sawfish, magnificent animal, is now caught up. The tide's gone out. We just happen to be moving along the beach here, uh, checking for crocodiles when I spotted it. All I can do is try and dig a bit of a hole around the gills Try and cut some of this net away from it and hope that when the tide comes in it'll still survive, but terrible tragedy. The long saw is used to thrash around in the water to kill fish. If you get too close to one of these, it can whip around and hit you on the leg and it can be very dangerous. We spent an hour or two trying to hold sufficient water around the poor old sawfish. But unfortunately, before the tide came in, it died. Just look at this. Another ecological disaster. Somebody's been netting in this mangrove creek and for some reason, best known to them, they've left their net here. It was only a week or so ago that we found that other net, not far from here, with that giant sawfish in it. And now another net. So I'm just going to cut it out and take it away and burn it. When you're out in the bush and you want to go fishing, you quite often don't have any bait. So most of us these days always carry a throw net. There are all sorts of ways of throwing a throw net. My preferred way is to just take your right hand, lay your rope on there, take the end of the net across the palm of the hand, half the net into the hand, Half the net across your knee, pick up the first piece over the first finger, arm's length, second piece over the second finger, arm's length again, third section over the third finger, then you just take a nice handful, 
there and you're ready to throw it. All you do is just go out and roll the wrist. The beauty of this is that you don't have a heavy, muddy, wet net dragged over your shoulder, which is the other preferred way. This way, all you have to do is just flick it out. Righto, we'll go and get some bait. Now I've got my bait, I can go fishing. Quite often out in the bush you need a fair degree of knowledge to recognise bush food. But this one here, we all know what this is, this is the large grevillea. It's easy to recognise and in it you've got this huge amount of nectar. It's very sweet but if you've been wandering around the scrub for quite a long time and you need something sweet, this is really nice. All you have to do is just find where the nectar is and suck it out. This little fruit is commonly called the, the wild passion fruit and looks very much like a, a normal passion fruit seed. Most people believe that this is a native to Australia but it's not. It originally came from South America but it's now spread all over the top end of Australia. Even in the remotest pockets of the Kimberley uh, you can find it's quite good bush tucker. The only thing is that don't pick these green ones and squash them and wipe your eye. They irritate your eye like mad. But these are uh, these little golden ones, beautiful to eat. When you're out in the bush and you've got a lot of meat, there's still a few places that salt the beef. The traditional way of uh, conserving meat, not many people do it these days, but it's a very handy thing to know. What you've got to do is you've got to take all the normal cuts off. It looks a little bit gory, but don't worry about that. Get them back to camp as soon as possible and treat them up, put all the salt on, and uh, it'll last for weeks, even months. The only thing is, of course, when you cook it, you've got to wash it and wash it and wash it and uh, get all the salt out of it and boil it two or three times it ends up like a, uh, a corned beef. Not too bad when you've been out here for a long time. Beef's got to have deep cuts in it to get the salt right into the, into the meat and once it's well salted it's stacked there with all the other meat and it's left there overnight and then each day that meat's spread out and at night stacked up until it's dry and it can be packed into a bag and this solid beef this will last you for months and of course when you want to cook it you have to wash the sole out of it several times and boil it up and it's like a corned beef but there's one very good way of preserving big mobs of beef This bit of salted beef is about four weeks old. Washed all the salt out of it last night, boiled it up. And it's um, still fairly salty, of course, but it's um, not too bad. Bit of homemade bread. Mm. This here is the tongue. Do it the same way. Bullock's tongue. Mm. That is very, very tender. When you're out in the bush and you've got a really tough bit of beef, uh, the best way to cook it is in the ground oven. Paper bark, hot stones, 
and uh, two or three hours, and it's a lot more tender than if you just try and cut bits off and cook it on the coals. How's that, Scotty? Good. The Maoris call this a hungi, and you call it... Gungun. Gungun, yeah, that's uh, the ground oven, eh? Mm -hmm. All right, well, that looks pretty good. We'll get the fire going in there now, eh? Yes. The secret of cooking in these ground ovens is to get the right sort of stone that doesn't explode and good fire and get your rocks very, very hot. That'll be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Once the fire's died down and the rocks are really hot, the meat goes in on those rocks there. One. So that looks right good, eh? I don't know, just the paper bark on top. Yeah. I tell you what, those crows, Scotty, know that it's uh, tucker time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, two. Probably have more than two anyway, just yeah. a bit of water. Just... Yeah, we just seal the whole thing in with the, the paper bark. Uh, three. A little hole there. Yeah, that's your now, once we've got the paper back on, cover it all over with the sand, leave it for a couple of hours, I can hardly wait. Good, eh? This is the tricky part. Just getting that paper bark off. Uh huh. Without getting too much sand on the meat. Yeah. Uh huh. Look at that. That's pretty good. Actually. Here we are. Look at that. It's beautiful. Uh, this is the side where the rocks have been. See all that juice there? All that heat from the rock has held all the juice in and it's like it's steamed. It's so sweet, so tender. When you're out in the bush, always end up with filthy, dirty hands. And in North Australia, around the Kimberleys along the coastal region, there's a great way of cleaning up. And it's right here. See this acacia bush? It's a fairly spindly bush. We call it a weed because it grows everywhere. Around about September, October, early November, after it's flowered, you get these bunches of seeds, these bean-like seeds here. See them there? Now if you pick quite a few bunches of those, and here we are, we'll just get some off here. Very common plant this one. Righto now. You've got no water, a bit of saliva, rub it together. I might just grab some water. Here we are. Now, what we do is Bit of water on there, rub it together. Now this is 100% environmentally friendly. Soaping up. This is called a, a soap bottle or a soap acacia. There we are. Beautiful, look at that. These are a good idea in the bush if you don't have a shower on your vehicle. It's called hot water from solar energy. You just fill it up with around about 20 litres of water and just leave it out in the sun all day. And at the end of the day, boiling water. That's what you've got to be very careful of. When you actually tie it up, ready to use it, make sure you check it because that water in there could be very hot. See the back of it's clear, so you can see how much water you've got in the bag.
if for any reason you want to move your vehicle sideways, but you can do it with care using your kangaroo jack. A good solid base for the jack. Jack it up one side and give it a push. Another one. Righto. Give it a push over. Here it goes. There we are. Very dangerous things, kangaroo jacks. Always watch them in case they slip. That vehicle has moved over almost half a metre. So, in an emergency, you can keep lifting it and moving it, and you can actually move that vehicle several metres. These high lift jacks are one of the most important pieces of equipment in the bush. What people do, they leave home, the vehicle all clean, all new equipment. They tie their jacks on the front of the bull bar there. And what happens is, as they're driving along, the insects clag up all the moving parts. They collect dust, they collect mud, seeds. When they go to use it, this is the result. Everything's jammed up. There's no way that that jack will work. So what you've got to do is give it a good clean and a good spray. Once you've cleaned your jack up, give it a good spray. I've got some Kellex penetrating fluid here, lubricating fluid, and especially these two moving springs here. So every time you use your jack, make sure you give it a good spray before you start. Check everything's moving. Right over. But the best thing is to keep it right up on the pack rack, wrap it well up, or inside the vehicle. We all hate flat tyres in the bush, but if you do get one, you've got to know how to fix it. Quite often, you have great difficulty breaking the bead, that is, breaking the tyre away from the rim. You should carry a bead breaker, but if you don't have a bead breaker, you can use your high lift jack. Position the base of the jack right on the edge of the rim. So what you're doing is jacking up. The weight of the vehicle will be pushing down on the tyre and it'll spring that bead. Bead's now broken, now I can proceed to fix the puncture. <laughs> There's another way to break the bead if you don't have a bead breaker or you don't have a kangaroo jack, and that's to use the weight of the vehicle. What you do is to put your tyre right there and drive over it. Get this tyre right on the edge of it there. 90% of the time you can pop it off. now broken away from the rim so I can proceed to 
change the tyre in the usual manner, with the help from the dog, of course. I've shown you lots of different ways that you can get your tyre off the rim if you don't have a bead breaker. But if you do a long trip, you should carry one of these. This tyre's been stuck on the rim for a long time, so you've got dry mud and dust down between the tyre and the rim and possibly even some rust. So it's going to be very hard to break that tyre from that rim. So what you need is a bead breaker. Depends on the size of your rim and your tyre as to how you adjust your R&R &R bead breaker. But basically you place this foot, this anchor, down in the bottom of the rim and you lock it across the top so this section here bites down on the inside of the rim. Just tighten that up. And all you do is just screw it down and it starts sliding forward at the same time that it's starting to push down on the tyre here. So you go down and give it a few turns. Now if it doesn't pop off immediately, what you do is you put some soapy water in here and you adjust this around several times until it pops off. Now that hasn't quite popped off the first time. So we get some soapy water soapy water here and go right round there with the soap and water. Just unwind it a few turns. Move it into a different position and wind it down the second or even the third time. And no matter how difficult the tyre is to break from the rim, the R&R &R bead breaker will always get it off. Once you've broken the first side, just turn it over and repeat the performance on the other side. You can also use the bead breaker to spread your tyre to check it inside for any cuts or cracks and you can also use it to put the tyre back on. Really great bit of gear. Don't go out in the bush without one of these. When you're out in the bush and you don't have any matches, a lot of people talk about starting a fire by shorting across the terminals. Now you can do that providing the battery is cold. If you've just taken the battery out of the car and it's hot, don't short across your terminals because often with a hot battery there's a build up of hydrogen gas in there and you could cause an explosion and you could get acid in your face. And you say to me, well, why do we even have to use a battery? Well, you might have had an accident, someone might be suffering from hypothermia, so you want to get a fire going and your car's just gone underwater and all your matches are wet, it's very cold. So, to be on the safe side, try and do it with a cool battery. But if you have to do it with a warm battery, try and get your spark as far away from the battery as possible. So what I'm doing here is putting on a piece of wire on the pos and the neg. Now just pull that up there. Just there. Right, uh, this way I can get the spark away from the battery, but I must stress, try and always do this when the battery is cool, not when it's hot. Now I've just got some fuel here, I'll get a little bit of fuel on a piece of cloth, we place that down there and I'll get rid of this right away from the spark, of course. There we are. Now, now it's a good idea to hold the wire with some rag because it does get very hot very quickly.
and there we have instant fire. But I must stress, you only want to do this in a survival situation when you really need a fire, like I've got now in a hurry, and certainly never ever use it with a hot battery. Don't short across the terminals. As I said earlier, you can get that build up of hydrogen gas and you can cause the battery to explode. I know what you're thinking. He's just said, start a fire using petrol and you've got a diesel car and you don't always carry petrol. Well, if you don't carry petrol, you quite often carry these little pieces of fine steel wool for cleaning up your billies and whatever. This is perfect for lighting a fire. All you have to do is place it down here. Now I've got a little bit of paper here and some dry grass. Just place it down there and I've got the wire on the positive and the negative terminals again away from the battery and this is a cold battery, not a hot battery. All we have to do is place the end of the wire is about two centimetres apart in the steel wall, and in a few seconds I'll have a fire. So next time you go out in the bush, in the old four-wheel drive, make sure you pack in some pieces of steel wall, just in case you want to light a fire in an emergency. At the end of a long trip in the bush, so many of us suffer from a bad back. I've got just the answer. Have a look at this. It's a portable nail bed. Put it down on the ground, lie on that for an hour. Absolutely wonderful. It's the best thing I've ever had. And of course, when I finish with it, I can just pack it up and put it back in the car. I'll just show you how it works. Just a matter of getting some flat ground and make a pillow. I've got a little rock here and I'll just use my shirt. If you do make one of these, the nails have got to be around about a centimetre apart. And when you first use it, if you find the nails a little bit sharp, well then start off with a, a towel, a beach towel. Righto, now, just on there, wiggle down and just ease yourself down on there and that is beautiful. Well, just within a few seconds you can feel yourself relaxing. Now if there's any products or anything you're interested in that you've seen in this film just drop me a note. We'll put the postal box address up on the screen now and the email address, and I think I'll just slow down and have a nice, relaxing sleep for an hour or two.